You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Sweet. Simon Hall. So. <clears throat> Um, my name is Simon Horman. Um, I work for myself at, in Tokyo. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a little bit of work I've been doing with a customer on, uh, on this guy, which is an embedded board. It's, it's not actually a mobile device, but uh, all of the little IP blocks on this device will eventually go into a mobile phone of some sort. Um, So the company that I'm working with is called Renesis. They're one of the largest mi microprocessor manufacturers in Japan. Um, the target of this work is this little guy I've got down here, the macro board. Um, the predecessor is the APV, AP4EB. Um, the macro board will be available for purchase next month or the month after that. The AP4 is never going to see the light of day. Um, I'm in possession of one of the few that exist. Um, the default bootloader on these devices is U-Boot, and we'd like not to use U-Boot anymore for various reasons. Um, we'd like to boot directly into Linux or to use Linux as the bootloader. Um, so why is it that we don't want to use U-Boot? Um, there are a few reasons. One of which is um, it's essentially re-implementing a bunch of stuff that's in Linux anyway, um, so that seems unnecessary. Um, there are some advantages to U-Boot. For instance, it's smaller, but these days with the amount of flash we have available to it, it us, that's not important at all. Um, it's a different tree, and it's not maintained perhaps as particularly well, at least in the opinions of, uh, of myself and, and my fellow developers. Um, and just fundamentally, we like to give people different options. So the role of the group that I'm involved in, firstly, we prove hardware. Um, Andrew Tridgell's quite well known for saying untested code is broken code. Well, it turns out that untested hardware is broken hardware as well. <laughs> <coughs> so one of my jobs in this project, which I'm talking about today, is I'm essentially the first person who's actually got uh, Linux to boot off, or not Linux as such, but like anything at all to boot off um, the S MMC block and not so much the SD block. Um, if someone doesn't prove that that works, it, it's quite likely it doesn't work. And we found some problems on the way, which I'll talk about. Um, we want to provide options for our customers. Fundamentally, our customers want to take hardware and software and sell it. Um, it turns out they're not particularly proficient at developing either hardware or software. Um, so we like to help them as much as they, we can. Um, and one of the nice things about Renesis is it's a very large organization. There's lots of red tape. It's hard to get anything done. I'm currently reverse engineering their own hardware. But the group I work in, we have an upstream first policy. So any code that I produce, as long as it doesn't contain secrets, we can just upstream it. And anything, I'm not exposed to, to any secrets. So anything that I can write, I can upstream. So that's kind of nice. So this presentation is fundamentally about booting. So let's take a look at what booting often looks like. Um, you have a little bit of code that's loaded off NorFlash, which is typically burnt. You, you can't modify this. Then this loads some code off NandFlash, which you can update if you have a JTAG available. And then you're off to the racer. So you usually have a ROM, and then a bootloader, and then a kernel image. This is pretty standard. This board does that kind of thing by default. Um, So what's the, the first goal I have is to boot the image, the Z image, to boot Linux straight from the NAND flash. And this goal has been successful. It will be in the next release kernel. So this is essentially the boot flow. It becomes slightly shorter, although that wasn't really the aim of the project. We go straight from the mask ROM to a, 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 a Z image. I'll go into a little bit more detail about how this works. I, I'm, I'm assuming most of you aren't intimately familiar with bootloaders. I certainly wasn't when I started this project. Um, so a Zed image looks a little bit like this. It has a loader right at the top, and then it has a compressed kernel image. And it's pretty straightforward. <coughs> so the process of Z booting from NAND, what does it look like? 
essentially we have on the RAM we have the um, the image it's been burnt there somehow um, and then the mask ROM actually knows how to copy the image over into NAND flash and to move the the execution state over to here. That's pretty simple. Once we get to here, the kernel hits the loader code, it uncompresses itself, it relocates itself, no problem. So we've basically just eliminated U-boot. It's not very complicated. The code, the patch to change this was, there's some assembly root code to set up some registers so you have some memory. Um, then you, basically jump set up the a tag so when the kernel gets a bit further in the boot it knows what type of board it's running on and you're off to the races it's m maybe a hundred lines probably less so that was pretty straightforward that works that's nice so we can now boot this guy without using a u boot but oh sorry i skipped it so this is the next slide where the kernel is now uncompressed and it's jumped so what's goal two? Booting off NAND is nice, but you need specialized equipment to be able to write to the NAND flash. I actually didn't have the equipment, so I would modify the code and then go down to the lab, which is like several suburbs away, and then they would burn it to flash, and it worked, so I only did that once. But um, it's not very practical because most people don't have this equipment available to them. Um, so it might be much more convenient if you could just get an MMC card, which is... It looks like this. It looks a lot like an SD card. Um, it's strongly related to SD cards. Um, it would be useful if you could just burn an image to this guy, which is trivial. My laptop has a hardware that's capable of doing it. You can buy a USB to a MMC converter for a handful of dollars. Um, finding MMC cards is a bit more tricky, but we have... I mean, I, I got this from Amazon. I had to wait for a week for it to arrive, but... It, maybe cost $10, I don't know, something like this. It's more accessible. So we'd like to be able to boot directly from that. So the boot process is going to look a bit like this. We start off with the mask ROM again. The mask ROM is kind of clever. Well, it has uh, various functions. And using some of the dip switches on this board, I can switch it. So instead of jumping to NAND, it tries to load uh, a bit of code off the MMC card and, and, uh, and boot that. Um, this loading that the mask ROM does is, is limited in some ways. It can only load a limited am amount of data. Um, so basically what we're going to do is get the mask ROM to just suck off the top part of the Z image, which contains the loader code. And then that loader code itself is going to reload the entire image. So this is, so we've added an extra stage, basically. Um, so the first stage is it's fairly straightforward. We have um, the entire, this is our MMC card, the little thing I held up just before. We have the loader and the compressed image sitting there, the Z image. There's actually a header that goes on top of that. It's not very exciting. Um, the header t just has a little bit of information telling the mask ROM how much data to suck, suck off and, and uh, where the data is on the card. And then it just copies it over here to the SD RAM. And importantly, it... Uh, sets execution over here. So now we're in the loader code. Um, so the mask ROM is essentially not modifiable. I, I know the people who wrote it, but it, it's burnt onto the CPU. It, even they can't modify it now. Um, but this guy is just some C code that I wrote on my PC and copied onto an MMC card. So that's cool. I have control over this. And inside here, I have code to load all of this guy somewhere else into memory like so. So there's a little bit of overhead because actually I've, I've copied the entire loader again even though I'm, I'm actually part way through executing it but that's okay it's just a, a, few, a few extra blocks. So then we jump to it again. We're, we're actually part way through the loader at this point so there's this magical thing where we have two copies of the same code in memory and we just jump to the next instruction in a completely different part of SDRAM but that's fine that's okay we can do that. And then after that, the loader does its normal thing of uncompressing the kernel and then jumping to it. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. 
I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that unproved hardware or untested hardware is broken hardware. I actually had the, to get the guys in the lab to do a hardware hack on the board, and they, they wouldn't disclose to me exactly what that was, but uh, <laughs> essentially this feature did not work. And so this is a problem f because we want to ship this, um, and yes, so it works for me. It works on this one. This one's been hacked. Um, I was... Unfortunately, the USB cable that I borrowed just now is the wrong size, but um, maybe if you're interested, or maybe I can just hold it up, it should boot. Let me. So I have to turn it on, and then I have to hit the reset switch, which activates the hardware hack. And if I'm lucky, it will work. Yes, it's working. So I can see some LEDs, which give me some status here. You may be able to see that the display came on, probably not because it's black. You have to trust me, you can come down and see it a bit later. Anyway, the first time I saw that was a very exciting moment for me because uh, it meant that essentially my project was successful. Um, so there we are, we can, we can do that, we can, we can boot. Of course you don't know if it's really booting off that, you have to trust me, but uh, I can assure you it is. Um, so that's nice. Now it turns out that this board actually has two related IP blocks. Uh, this is the MMCIF hardware block, um, which is capable of, of reading MMC cards. It's, it's produced by Renesis. There's another hardware block on over, over, over on this side, which takes both SD and MMC cards. They, they look quite similar. They're not similar, but they look similar. Physically, they're similar. Um, so the next goal was to try and get to boot off this guy, because as I mentioned, MMC cards are actually a little tricky to get your hands on. You, you probably can't go down to uh, your local electronics shop and pick one up. You probably have to order one. SD cards, on the other hand, you probably have some in your house anyway, and if you don't, like, you probably the local convenience store sells them, and they're very easy to obtain. So it would be nice to be able to boot off that. This turns out to be a slightly more challenging project. Um, and I, I won't describe the boot process because it's basically the same except different jumper settings. Um, but unfortunately, it's not working yet because, so we have SD and MMC, but we also have E variants where E means embedded, so ESD and EMMC. And um, the manual that I have specifies that this guy needs EMMC, but as you have just witnessed, that's actually not true. Um, so that's, but that's fortunate because you can't buy an eMMC card because inherently e means embedded, which means sort of soldered on. And uh, I, 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 I'm not very good at soldering. And um, I, I imagine you have to buy these things in fairly large quantities. Um, okay, so back to why SDHI isn't working yet. Um, essentially, the specification that I have says ESD, not SD. And the guys in the lab told me that, in fact, that is true this time. Last time they said the EMC was false. So they're very nice at pointing things out. Um, so we're having to borrow one from uh, someone in some other part of Japan. And uh, hopefully it'll be there when I get back next week. Um, but now we're in the awkward situation. So this, is, this has all been very nice. From a software point of view, I, I've been fairly successful. I mean, the boots, that's good. Um, but, but from approving the hardware point of view, this has been um, not particularly successful because we're in a situation where we, we know that this one doesn't work without a hardware hack, so that's bad. And we're now in this situation where we strongly suspect that this guy requires a specialized card that essentially you can't buy. Um, so we may well, or not me personally, but the people who sell this may well be in the situation of having to ship special cards with it, which will probably be in the form of a PCB that pokes out with something soldered onto the end of it. Um, I've seen such things in the lab. So that is the end of what I wanted to talk about today. And uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free. or I'll be around all week. Just come up and ask me. Um, with the card moving in the kernel, can you see somebody like Google picking it up or transferring it into Android or something like that? Right, so the question is whether or not uh, other vendors, perhaps Google might pick this up. So the bit of code that has to go in, it's actually board specific, so uh, you'll need one of these bits of code for every single device. Um, but that's not so bad. You, that code has to exist somewhere because the code, if the device boots. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so it, for certainly from the Renesas side, the SH Mobile platform, this is what we'd like to do going forward. And it's in a, um, it's been done in such a way that um, people could basically copy, copy our template and do add the same 50 lines of code, slightly different 50 lines of code for every board. And I think that would be quite nice. So there, there are some people who are fundamentally opposed to the idea of using Linux as a bootloader. Um, it's a bit sl If you want to do the single stage boot, which is what I just did, demonstrated, where you go straight into Linux, that's OK, but it's not really upgradable. It's OK for developers. So you might want to do a chain boot. And in that case, Linux is a bit slower because it's bigger. Um, what about things like the generic distribution kernel that had you know, generally uses an NRD simplified modules and stuff like that? This doesn't seem like there's any way to pass any parameters that you need. Either module parameters or NRDs or OK, so. I guess in, if you wanted to use a generic kernel, um, then you probably would be in, in the two-stage boot process, where you'd use Linux as the bootloader, and then you'd skip on. So far as passing co command line parameters, they, you can. I mean, they're compiled into the kernel. It's a config option. But fundamentally, on ARM at the, at the moment, there's a problem. You can't make an ARM distro kernel, because it's impossible to make an ARM kernel that will boot on more than certainly more than a handful of very related boards, but essentially every board needs its own kernel compiled. Um, this is one of the things that Linaro guys are working on. So once that has gone in and you can now make a distro ARM kernel, I would expect that those kind of questions will be addressed. Yes? What's the uh, end user of one of those boards? <laughs> so this guy is just a development board. Um, people like me use it to develop code. For, um, so what Renesis does is they make um, hardware IP, so the, the different chips on this essentially, well not even the chips, just the IP. Um, and the idea is that they eventually go into embedded devices, um, a lot of mobile phones, a lot of vending machines. Um, so Japan's known to have a lot of vending machines and almost all of them have predecessors of the hardware that's on this board. Um, it's, I mean, this is basically a hobbyist device as it stands, but the technology moves on and it finds its way. I mean, it's a bit small, a bit big to go in my pocket. And actually, the, one of the boards we have in the, in the office is sort of this big. So, uh, I mean, it doesn't fit in my pocket. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just development work. Any more? Yeah, ah, yes. Yeah, like about, nope, here. Right, so the question is, do I have to do any MMU tricks or any tricks at all to achieve this? And the answer is it's way too early. There's no, there's no tricks at all. There's, there's nothing to trick. <laughs> this is only like sort of a couple of hundred instructions away from ground zero, so. Jumps work, yes. That, that was a question we were wondering during the development process, but uh, which is why it was a particularly happy moment when it worked. <laughs> um, another interesting thing is essentially we don't really have interrupts. So typically your SD driver code is, is interrupt based. You send a request and then an interrupt comes back. We can't do that. That's OK. But um, except I don't really, the thing that makes, this guy's OK. I have specs. This guy, um, sort of I got home and I was, on the email, it's like, oh, so can you send me the documents through? And they're like, no chance. So <laughs> basically, this is, I have actually, re, re, well, reverse engineer is perhaps too strong a term, but the way I got this, this load of, the way I got this, this portion working over here, as much as it does work at the moment, is by examining the Linux driver, which of course uses interrupts. So it does slight things slightly different. But that's OK. Um, I got it working. Um, but this is really, really early on. There's nothing. There's no. This is why I use the LEDs for debugging. I can't print stuff to the console even. Um, so life's simple, but it also life's difficult. <laughs> yes. I'm 
Okay, so perhaps I should have spoken about the header, which I didn't even draw on this diagram. Um, it's a couple of hundred bytes, which describes basically where this is, where it's going to go, and we just write that raw to a location of the MMC, which is determined in the manual. In this case, it's at an offset of one block, which is 512 bytes. Um, yes, we just, I use DD. <laughs> Um, the the e EESD stuff on that side is more interesting because one of the features of ESD is it has a boot partition, uh, um, not in the sense of partitions that we configure using FDisk, like actually in hardware, um, and it will go in there. And that's why I can't use a normal SD card because I don't have it. Um, but yes, to, to answer your question, there's a, there's a special header and we jump, dump it to the device. That's right. The cards to get oh, I mean, the cards are reusable, but yes, yes. No, you you can't have uh, two images. I mean, you could. There is space for two cards, I guess. So maybe that might work. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, have yes. Sorry. One last question. Right. So the question is. Couldn't we just, well, are there plans to use standard SD cards? Um, I will certainly be encouraging that line of thought. <laughs> um, like I said, like, part of the job is to prove stuff, and even if it's not software, it's like to point out things that are obviously inconvenient. <laughs> um, so what we want, or what the people who pay me to be interested in this want, is for people to be able to buy this and to be able to do some kind of development on it. And using a JTAG is, is overhead, so this card thing is kind of worthwhile, but if it has to be an ESD card, then it's, you've got to buy special equipment anyway. So um, the answer is yes, I think that's a very good idea, and I will try and promote it internally. <laughs> Thank you very much.